sola scriptura. Oh, that's right, I'm starting off with Latin. How nice. That phrase, though, is one of the most important views of the Protestant Reformation, meaning simply Scripture alone. Now, I have to take you back to that time period of the Protestant Reformation because wouldn't it be fun to come to church and have someone read Scripture for you in a language that you didn't understand at all? Lots of fun. And then they proceed to tell you what it says. Well, that would be just joyous, except for the fact that maybe their interpretation isn't always correct. The Reformation was important to the development of Western civilization, not because it led to the development of churches like ours, although I think it's pretty nice, because it was a stepping stone that led to democracies like the United States. They had their roots in the Protestant Reformation. Sola Scriptura meant that Scripture alone was the supreme authority over the church. The Bible ruled over reason and tradition because it alone was infallible as God's world, as God's word, that is. All other authorities, including church leadership, according to this thinking, were fallible and must submit to Scripture. Before the Reformation, the church taught that the institutional church's leadership, the bishops headed by the pope, were the true interpreters of Scripture. Whatever they said went. That effectively paints the teaching authority of the bishops over Scripture itself. And the Reformation was the turning point. The supreme authority of Scripture served to help keep church leadership accountable. But it was also more than that. Because when they talked about Scripture alone, they were talking about the clarity of Scripture. And that doesn't mean that all of Scripture was crystal clear to everyone that read it, because we know today that's not the case. We can read the Bible, and there's a lot of things that don't seem crystal clear to us. And it didn't suggest that pastors and teachers weren't needed to help people understand Scripture. Instead, that phrase, clarity of Scripture, meant that any person could read Scripture for themselves and discover the basic way to salvation. They'd hear the story of Jesus, they'd hear the message of Jesus, and they would know the pathway to salvation. The Reformers agreed that there were parts of Scripture that were difficult to understand. But what they said was the unclear parts should be judged based on the clear parts. And we kind of use that today. That's why the clarity of Scripture helped drive reformers to put the Bible in the language of the people rather than something that was elevated beyond their means. Scripture was, in the words of William Tyndale, even for plowboys. He said lay people needed to be fed with God's Word, and they were required to keep preachers accountable with an open Bible in their hands. Tyndale believed it so firmly that he lost his life simply for translating Scripture into English. Now, the difficult part for us is when you talk about those clear parts of Scripture because they're not always so clear. Now, we heard today's gospel lesson from two of the most current translations of the Bible, the New Revised Standard Version that's in your pews and the Common English Bible, which is fairly new compared to most others. And for the majority of us who went through seminary and did studying of the Bible, for the last 30 plus years, we were taught and used the NRSB. It's considered the most academically correct translation. And if you look at anything that comes from the denomination, it always has scripture quotations that come from the New Revised Standard Version. It's kind of our official version. And that's because the NRSB tries to follow the structures of the Hebrew and Greek language from the original biblical sources. But because of that, it sometimes comes across a bit stiff. The CEB, or Common English Bible, is very different. It isn't just a revision or update of an existing translation. It was fairly new, and the reason they did it was to make the Bible accessible to a broader range of people. It's written at a comfortable level for over half of all English readers. As the translators did their work, they had reading specialists working with 77 reading groups from more than a dozen denominations, including the PCUSA, to review the text to ensure that there was a smooth and natural reading experience. 
And I've always found that it is a much easier one to read, especially in worship settings. It represents the work of a diverse team, the work of over 120 scholars, men and women from 24 faith traditions in America, Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latino communities. And as a result, it can be used by a broader audience of Bible readers, from children all the way to scholars. And now before I bore you to death with any more academic institution in the language, I want to get back to the main language, which is this. The Bible is meant for all people. But that's not as simple as it sounds. I wanted to read the two translations today to show you how even the most talented and trained scholars can differ on exactly how they want to translate passages of the Bible. And what do we do when the Gospels, especially, differ from each other? The Beatitudes, or blessings, is a perfect example. A lot of us have grown up hearing the Beatitudes as in blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the poor in spirit. Sue and I are going to concentrate on Matthew's Sermon on the Mount during Lent because it is one of the most important teaching sections in the entire Gospels. But I want you to compare the Beatitudes that you heard this morning from Matthew to the Beatitudes from Luke's Gospel, which is similar but different. The first thing is the location. We call this the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone knows the Sermon on the Mount. How often do you hear Sermon on the Plain? But that's what it's called in Luke, the Sermon on the Plain. It was not on top of a mountain. Jesus taught on a level ground, which I think image-wise has a lot to do with what you hear. And listen to what's different in Jesus' words from Luke. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when all speak well of you, for that's what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Boy, do I feel uplifted. Not only is the tone different, but the teaching is significantly different in a way because, think of it, instead of the blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the poor. Instead of blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, it's blessed are those who are hungry. And it's not just the blessings. In Luke, we get what I call the woes. Woe, after hearing some of those things. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full now. Woe to you who are laughing now. Woe to you when all speak well of you. Wow. I don't know about you, but those aren't exactly subtle differences. It's a much different message in one gospel than it is in the other. And the thing is, I can still remember clearly when we had this discussion back in seminary. Our professor had pointed out the under, importance of understanding the different audiences that the gospel writers were reaching out to. But this was one of the most important teachings of the gospels. You kind of have to wonder why there would be such vast differences. And he pointed out because Jesus came to bring the gospel, the good news of God's love and forgiveness, to everyone, to the rich as well as the poor, the well-fed as well as the hungry, the joyful as well as those who were persecuted. And in both gospels, the writers take Jesus' teachings and make them relevant, but to a different audience. I mean, surely if you are poor and hungry or if you have been someone who's been persecuted, you love Luke's gospel. And that's who the kind of people Luke was aiming his teachings for. But not everybody's poor and not everybody's hungry. Our professor pointed out to us, he said, you know, just because people have money doesn't mean they don't have problems or they don't have challenges. 
He said that's what Matthew's gospel does. It reminds us there are ways to be poor and ways to be hungry that don't have anything to do with money or food. If you think about it, one of the perfect examples of this is how important it is what we can do with some of the blessings we've received in our lives. One of the perfect examples for me is Bill Gates. Now everyone knows who Bill Gates is, right? For the most part. The founder of Microsoft, more money than God. <laughs> or at least he took it from God. Now, what you may not know is that Bill Gates wasn't the nicest guy. In the beginning of his business world, people will tell you there are a lot of stories about it, about what Microsoft did and the way they squashed other companies. Are there any computer programmers here? I had one. Anybody know Novell DOS? Yeah, okay. We won't talk about that one. I could talk about that one earlier because Nelson, you should have known that it would be Nelson, was the one that had actually had some experience. It was a company that made a, an operating system that was a real challenge to Microsoft's in the early days, and it was a much better one. I used it on my first computer, and it was like, wow, this is much better than Microsoft's version. And then it disappeared because Microsoft bought it. They, didn't, they took some of the good elements, but they got rid of it. And that was Gates' approach to everything. If they're not going to, if you can't buy them up, you're going to squash them one way or the other. And he was not known as a nice person. Now, like a lot of us, I think he got married and got better. <laughs> Just making sure I got that one in there. <laughs> Because Bill Gates is now one of the world's greatest philanthropists. He, along with Warren Buffett, are people that have taken their wealth and are using it to make a difference in the world. Some of the things that they've done in Africa as far as combating disease and malaria and other things are incredible and couldn't be done by the ordinary person. That's one of those few times where you can take your wealth and you can use it for something special. But I think what that professor was trying to point out to us was, you know, that there are things that weigh us down and cause us to sin. Someone who might be hungry or poor might find themselves in a position where they don't know what to do, and so they get desperate, and maybe they commit a crime because they don't have anything to feed their family otherwise. Now, the person who has plenty of wealth may not have that problem, but he may have other problems, or she may have other problems. The main thing is that the reason there's so much difference in some of these gospel teachings and writings isn't because one's right and the other one's wrong. It's because the gospel message is for everyone. And sometimes those writers knew that well. They had to adjust what they were writing. I like to say that people were very pragmatic back in those days. We might consider that being wishy-washy or political. Paul was especially good at that. When you think about the Apostle Paul, who was, by all accounts, the greatest evangelist in the history of the Christian church, if you go back and read Paul's letters very carefully, you discover he talked out of both sides of his mouth. Paul said things that you couldn't, you go, what? You just said something different in the last one. For instance, there's that little section in one of the letters where he tells women to cover their heads, shut up, don't speak in church. On the other hand, there's another letter where he's praising women who are the heads of some local churches. Now, what the heck is going on? Well, think of it this way. Paul had one focus, one focus, and this is it, and that was to let people know and convince people that salvation came through Jesus Christ. The good news was that Jesus Christ had come, had taught us, and had died for our sins and was resurrected again by God. He didn't come in and say, I mean, could you imagine this? Walk, you're walking into a community for the first time and you walk in and say, you know, everything you're doing over there is wrong. 
Now let me tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you think that's going to work real well? I think people have this tendency to throw up a wall once you immediately start telling them how wrong they are and what they do. But Paul took a different approach. He came in and, sadly to say sometimes, he went along with the local culture. But the perfect example of this is in a little letter called Philemon. It's one of the shortest books of the Bible. And in it, Philemon was a slave who had run away from his master and who was being sent back to his master by Paul. Now, this was actually used back in the days of the Civil War as an example of saying, see, the Bible says slavery is okay. Well, what had happened was this slave had run away, had come to join Paul because he'd heard the words of Paul teaching to him in his master's home. And so after a while, Paul said, you really need to go back because you're on the run. But here, take this letter with you. And in it, Paul says this sly little thing, he's returning to you, and I know you will treat him as a fellow brother in Christ. And I imagine his master got the letter and said, no. I've got to, no. Here and I wanted to beat him because he ran away as a slave. But I'm supposed to treat him as a fellow brother in Christ. That's what so much of the Bible does is it takes elements of where we are in our lives and says, okay, there's more. Yes, this is where you're at. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that God's love is with you forever. That God will lift you up. And it doesn't make a difference whether you're rich or whether you're poor. It doesn't make a difference whether you're hungry or well-fed, whether you are living a content life now or whether you are persecuted God is with you, and there is more to life than what you are doing right now. The Sermon on the Mount, as I said, is one of those great teachings, and the Beatitudes are special, because in Matthew's Gospel, we recognize that much of his teachings are pointed at the church. All the Gospels are directed at different audiences, but Matthew's Gospel is the only one that mentions ecclesia in the Greek, which means the church. Matthew's trying to tell the church how we're supposed to live. So the, Paul recognizes that there will be, excuse me, Matthew recognizes there are going to be people in church that may have wealth. They don't need to hear only the poor and hungry are being cared for. But they, too, have something to hear from Jesus. And the message of Jesus Christ is one that transcends all boundaries. That's the thing we learn the most. For we are blessed, whether we're peacemakers, whether we're those who hunger, whether we're those who hunger for righteousness, any of us who seek to do the will of God are blessed. Amen.